character to trying to interpret what you're hearing. So there's not much of this research done here. There's a lot done in Europe still, though. And then we have decoding of encrypted messages. Back in the late 1800s, some of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research decided to plan evidence for survival. So they would leave encrypted messages with the idea that after they died, they would communicate post-mortem the key to decipher the message. Now back in the 1800s, that would have been hard to do. You could, it would have been hard to decipher messages without knowing the key. Now, it's very simple with a computer. So Ian Stevenson developed a modification of this. And we have combination padlocks that you can set the combination to. And the idea is that you would set the combination to your lock and then memorize a mnemonic device, a phrase or a word, that can be translated into a series of numbers that will open the lock. You never write down the combination or the mnemonic. So the key to opening the lock exists only in your mind and nowhere else. And then after you die, you will communicate the key. We have some two dozen locks in our office. And none of them, for none of them have we gotten the combination uh, committed, transmitted to, it, to us yet. The third hypothesis I mentioned was that, oops, was that the mind can function independent of the brain. Now this is not a sufficient condition for survival, but it is a necessary condition for survival. If you don't have mind functioning without brain, then you don't have survival because the brain most likely does die. We have lots of evidence for this. In fact, several of my colleagues recently published this book, Irreducible Mind, with 800 pages of very densely packed evidence, mostly from medical journals, of mind functioning without the brain or independent of the brain. I won't read it to you now. <laughs> but I will mention some of the more dramatic lines of evidence. First is deathbed recovery of lost mental function. This happens typically in people who have dementia, who have been unable to recognize people for decades, people with chronic schizophrenia who have been psychotic for decades. And then on their deathbeds, they suddenly become rational, lucid, remember family members, speak coherently. Now this is extremely rare. Most people with dementia do not recover before death. But that it happens at all is something material science cannot explain. How often does it happen? We don't know. If you talk to hospice workers, they will say, oh yeah, I've got lots of examples of that. But there's almost nothing written in the medical literature about it. Nevertheless, we found 79 cases in the medical literature of people with severe dementia or chronic psychoses who in the hours before death or sometimes in the days before death suddenly became lucid again. Then we have people with normal intelligence with minimal brain tissue. And this is brought to our attention by a British uh, neurologist, John Lorber, who is specializing in severe hydrocephalus, uh, usually children who have the cerebral ventricles, which are filled with fluid, tremendously swollen so that it presses on the brain. And in some of these cases, you have just a tiny couple of millimeters of cerebral cortex around the outside of the ventricles. Some of these are so severe, it's hard to imagine the child even living, let alone having a normal intelligence. And in fact, most of them do not have normal intelligence, but some do. In fact, some have high intelligence. One of Lorber's colleagues at the University of Cambridge, where he worked, was a math, math professor and said to Lorber one day, I've got a grad student whose head is so big, it looks like one of your hydrocephalic kids. Would you take a look at him? So Lorber did. On the left is a normal brain scan. The stippled area is cortex, and the dark area in the middle is the ventricles full of fluid. On the right is this 26-year-old grad student in math at Cambridge with virtually no cerebral cortex, but functioning as a grad student in math at Cambridge. <laughs> 
What else have we got? We have evidence from near-death experiences, a variety of things about near-death experiences that relate to survival of death. First, almost all near-death experiences report that their thinking processes during the NDE was faster and clearer than it ever has been before at a time when their brains were impaired. And in some of these cases, we have very good documentation of the brains being impaired. For example, in cardiac arrest, where there was no blood going to the brain. And yet, these people say, my thinking was better than ever, almost as if, as they say, my mind was free of the limitations of the physical brain. One fellow that I interviewed was a guy who had overdosed on medications in a suicide attempt and then started hallucinating and he was seeing uh, little humanoid figures around him. And then he had started having second thoughts about the suicide attempt. So he tried to make it from his bed where he was to a telephone. And he was having a very hard time because these humanoid figures were stopping, were getting in his way. And at that point, he drew out of his body and from a position about 10 feet behind his body, his thinking suddenly became crystal clear. And he looked at his body, and his body was looking around confusedly. And from where he was, 10 feet behind, he could not see these humanoid figures. But he remembered being in the body hallucinating. So here we have a brain that's still hallucinating, while the subject, the person, out of the body is not hallucinating. So how does medical science make sense of that? We also have accurate perceptions from an out-of-body perspective. We have lots of examples of this, lots of quote anecdotes about this. One of my favorites is a fellow that I knew in Connecticut named Al Sullivan, who was a truck driver. And during open heart surgery, he left his body, and as he described it, he saw the surgeon flapping his wings as if he was trying to fly. Now, I've been in medicine for four decades. I've never seen a surgeon do this. But Al described it to me. He said, yep, he's going like this. I said, well, did you ask him about it? He said, yeah. After the surgery, I asked the surgeon, why were you doing that? And he said, the surgeon got very red faced and said, who told you about that? And Al said, nobody told me, I saw it. When you killed me, I withdrew, left my body, and I watched it. And the surgeon got very angry and said, well, you're here now, aren't you? I must have, I must have done something, right? And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> By the time Al told me this, it was several years later, so I figured it was safe for me to talk to the surgeon. So I did. And I asked him about this. And he said that he had developed this habit of letting his residents start the surgery. And then he would go in after they got started. And he had scrubbed his hands, they were gowned and gloved, and he wasn't gonna operate, he was gonna just watch them for a while. We wanted to make sure he didn't touch anything that wasn't sterile and contaminate his hands. So he put them where he knew they wouldn't touch anything. And then he supervised them. You know, pull over there a little more, no, cover there. You know. I've never seen Anybody else do this? <laughs> this doesn't happen on house or ER. I don't think Al could have seen it. So are these just anecdotes? Yeah. Jan Holden has looked at the literature of veridical perception in near-death experiences, and she found 107 cases in the published literature. Of those, there were 98 that were completely accurate. There were only eight that had any inaccuracy at all in them. Of those 98 that were completely accurate, 41 were corroborated as being accurate by a third party. Now, in spite of all these, quote, anecdotes, we don't have any experimental verification of this, controlled studies. There have been a few people who tried to plant targets where patients might have NDEs. Now, the skeptics like to say, well, with all the control studies you've done, you've never had a single person out of their body seeing something accurately. Well, all these studies we've done have looked at a total of 12 people so far. 